we covered the 10 offenses two days ago or a few days ago. And then after covering it, I gave my uh, explanations. Now we're taking the explanations of Raghunath Das Babaji, who is the spiritual master of Vijay. Vijay is asking questions in relationship to these 10 offenses in the form of explanations. And Raghunath Das Babaji is now explaining. So the first day we did offenses one through seven with the explanations given by Raghunath Das Babaji. Now we'll begin with number eight. Vijay says, Kindly explain the eighth offense and thus increase our happiness. First, we'll begin Om Gyan to Miranda Siyake Arjana Salakaya Chaksun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Veda Maha Ma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve, Gorvani Puchari Nenye Vishesa Sunyavari, Pastyatya Deisa Tare, Jai Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Andreka Gadadhar, Sri Vasadi Gorvati Lingam, Panchakalpa Tarubhascha Kripa Siddha, Peeva Chapatitanam, Pavane Dyo, Vaishnavi Dyo, Namakana Mahajais, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Vijay, kindly explain the eighth offense and thus increase our happiness. <clears throat> so he's saying thus increase our happiness, that means we want to know. And when we have the knowledge, we will be in a better position to experience the happiness of chanting the holy names. <clears throat> Raghunath Das Babaji says, to understand the eighth apparat, one must discriminate between pious activities and devotional service. A very important statement being made there. Sadkarma comprises the Naimitika Dharma of an ashram. Giving in charity, observing religious vows, performing philanthropic works, renouncing everything, including the fruits of one's labor, conducting religious sacrifices, practicing Astanga Yoga, and so on. In addition, all other material pious deeds as prescribed in the Shastras are within the purview of mundane dharma, known as Jada Dharma. So mundane dharma is more like pious activities. It's called jada dharma. They are not spiritual. In contrast, chanting Sri Krishna Nam is a super mundane, pure spiritual activity. Okay. So who can recite the eighth offense? Who knows what is the eighth offense? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, I can do that. Uh, to understand the eighth Nama Prath, one must discriminate between pious activities and devotional service. No, 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 not as written here. Give your own the, the, the definition that we recite all the time. What is the eighth of prayers? Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj, uh, to consider the chanting of Hare Krishna to be an imagination. No, that's no, not. Sorry, uh, to consider the chanting of Hare Krishna as one of the auspicious ritualistic activities. Um, which are um, offered in the Vedas as the fruitive activities, karma kanda. Correct. That's the exact explanation. To consider the chanting of Hare Krishna to be one of the auspicious ritualistic activities that are offered in the Vedas as karma kanda. So here, Raghunath Das Goswami is making this distinction between pious activities and devotional service. And he lists the pious activities, some of them, and then he shows the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra is a pure spiritual activity. They are two distinct categories. Uh, Sat karma activities are only upaya, a means to an end. Sat karma activities, that means 
activities that are um, So and this term means t eternal karmic activities, hold up the illusionary promise of material bliss as the ultimate goal, but are only a means and not the final goal. That's important. There are means, that means they move you forward <clears throat> on the on the on the realm of mm, coming closer or more pure in the mode of goodness, but they are not the final goal. Chanting Harinam is different. At the beginning stage of sadhana bhakti, chanting Harinam is indeed the dynamic sadhana. However, at the culmination of one's spiritual endeavor, the chanting is transformed from the sadhana into the sadhya and to the very sadhya sought by the early practice. So what, what does sadhya mean? Who knows the definition of sadhya? It's a one word definition. Any one of our participants out there, devotees know what the word sadhya means? Uh, does it mean goal, dear Guru Maharaj? Yeah, it means goal. Exactly. <clears throat> the chanting is transformed from the sadhana into the very goal sought by the early practice. Therefore, chanting Harinam must not be compared to any material activity, pious, religious, or otherwise. This is a very, very important offense to me to note because this is a this gets abridged many times or gets committed many times by people who have some background in pious activities and have a tendency to put everything in one category, including devotional practices. Those who do not accept this view are considered offenders against the Harinam. So it's an offense to connect the mode of goodness, religious activities with the transcendental chanting of the holy name as being the same, or the benefits being the same. Those who believe that chanting Harinam achieves the same transient mediocre results as Sat Karma commit operat against Harinam by equating altruistic performances with the chanting of Harinam. So you got, and that's clear now. This is altruistic, it's in the mode of goodness, but Harinam is the is completely transcendental to three modes of material nature. It's the pure spiritual essence of the process of bhakti yoga, and it cannot be compared or equated with any of these other activities which are transient and in the mode of goodness. <clears throat> You must clearly understand the distinction between material and spiritual activity and their respective results. So this is a very uh, important principle to understand because many, many people have that, they make this uh, error of equating um, Harinam or any devotional activities with religious, pious activities that are in the mode of goodness. Abhideya Gyan, so who knows what Abhideya Gyan means? The process to connect to Krishna, Krishna is in um, uh, Prayojana Abhideya and the Sambandha, so Sambandha Prayojana and Abhideya. So what does Abhideya mean? Prayojana Sambandha. Abhideya is the final goal where uh, we, you want to reach to basically. No, that's not correct. <laughs> The process, the process, of, yes. Yes, the process, the activities of Krishna consciousness that are carried out in order to reach the goal of prayojana. Right, yes. exactly. Abhideya directs the chanting Harinam, directs that chanting Harinam is transcendental. So the knowledge of the process teaches us that Harinam is transcendental. 
and that the path of mundane sat karma, these are the other activities mentioned previously, cannot help one reach the absolute transcendental goal. So both are distinct, one is superior to the other, and one will give you the results of the goal of devotional service, the other will not. So this is, uh, as we mentioned earlier, for the sake of bre brevity, we are repeating this point to, to uh, give an understanding. Be careful, this, uh, this offense is very easily committed. You know, you do your homa, I do my puja, we do our sacrifices, we give you charity, we chant mantras, you chant Hare Krishna. So it's all of equal merit. That is, uh, that is defeated here by this explanation here. Okay, any questions regarding this before we move to the next offense? Devotees, do you have any questions on this, what we just discussed? Uh, yes, please, Satya Bama. Your Guru yes. Maharaj, accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Srila Prabhupada, all glories to your divine lotus feet. Guru Maharaj, on this point of these activities are, even though pious and even though in the mode of goodness, they are still on the material platform. This is uh, uh, going to give only a material result. It's not going to give a transcendental result. But this is not known uh, and therefore people continue to perform these other activities. Is that is that correct? Yeah, it's quite popular to make the, to fall into this offense. Not the word popular, but it's it's very people profusely make this mistake because right. they they don't know the, the transcendental position of the of the holy name. Hmm. Yes, Guru Therefore, okay. education into the holy name will help them make the easy see the distinction between religious and pious activities and mm -hmm. transcendental activities. Thank you very much. One will elevate one from the lower modes to a higher mode, and the other one will take one to the goal, which is Prema Pumar to Mahalo. Any other questions or comments on this particular eighth offense? Yes, Vishya Prabhu, go on. I have a question because we should be in the mode of goodness while chanting, otherwise uh, with disturbed mind we are hard to get any result. So even though if we are not in the mode of goodness and we are chanting, are we uh, being raised to the mode of goodness or we should yeah. do a separate endeavor? You, you're being raised by the... Uh... By the chanting, you're being raised above the mode of goodness, you're being raised to the liberated platform. That's why chanting is available for everyone. Because chanting purifies and elevates. <clears throat> then you can't you can't say, Well, I have to wait till I'm elevated to chanting. Well, here's the process for becoming elevated. How is this connected with when they say that if you are chanting intensively, you can chant for many lifetimes and not get any result? Yeah, it doesn't affect the holy name at all. The holy name is still illuminating, transcendental, pure, but your consciousness is not correct and therefore you cannot get the results. The holy name doesn't change positions according to your consciousness. It's always transcendental, pure, and Krishna himself. But your consciousness is affected by the, the, the uh, modes of material energy, and therefore 
you're not able to experience the pure, the, the pure uh, mercy of the Holy Name. But the effect is there. Okay, thank you. Well, if you continue chanting and then you try to overcome the offenses, gradually you'll start to elevate yourself and your consciousness will start to um, awaken to, that, to the joy of chanting of the Holy Name. But the, the holy, holy, this is the, the example is given, and Prabhupada uses it all the time, that the, uh, the person who has jaundice, <clears throat> um, they give sugar cane to a jaundice person. But because of the jaundice or the disease, sugar cane tastes bitter. That's why people give up chanting of the holy name. It's not because the holy name is not sweet and powerful and transcendental it's because their consciousness is in the lower modes and they can't experience. But Prabhupada says you continue chanting and just like you continue taking this bitter medicine, although it's actually sweet, it appears to be bitter, but that's the due to the disease. Uh, then gradually you'll start to do uh, experience the sweetness the same way as the as one continues to take the can, the sugar candy, one can understand that one's disease is being cured as the sweetness of the sugar candy starts to become tasted. The sugar candy is always the same. The holy name is always the same. It's not going to change because of our disease condition. The experience is due to the disease and not to the holy name. Thank you. Okay. All right. So Mahalaya, we'll move. I have one more question, please, if I may ask on this eighth offense. Mm -hmm. So people who are ritualistically inclined, who oh, have been doing this, this is in our family tradition, we've been doing uh, you know, century after century after century, and this is our family practice, and this is what we do. How they are going to ever understand the value of chanting the holy name of the Lord when it is so entrenched in their consciousness that this is what we do? Well, for persons like that, we don't tell them to stop their ritualistic activities. We just tell them to add the chanting of the holy name. Mm. And then hopefully, or they will also be able to taste the chanting of the Holy Name <laughs> and see mm. the difference and experience the difference. So, uh, okay. yeah, if we try to replace it arbitrarily, it will, they won't be able to accept it or understand it, understand it or accept it. So, therefore, we just say, chant Hare Krishna, you can... Continue on with your pujas, your homas, your various types of sacrifices. But they'll fall away if one uh, is, is actually developing in the chanting. And that's true with many of us. We've been through that, that experience. We've done these things and now we don't do them anymore because we are tasting the happiness of chanting Hare Krishna. Mm. And these ritualistic performances, there's no joy in it. It's a lot of work, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> you get some satisfaction by performing the work, but the, the effort itself is just, uh, can be very arduous. And if you do anything wrong in these ritualistic activities, the whole thing is, is lost. You get no benefit. Ooh. Thank you so much, Guru Maharaj. Okay, we'll do the ninth offense here. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Guru Maharaj. There is um, one more devotee has raised the hand. Okay. Uh, and uh, yes, gone. Um, uh, I think it's uh, uh, the nam name is yes, gone, Prabhu.
we can't hear you nat prabhu oh sorry mata ji um hari krishna guru maharaj please accept my humble obeisances all glories to shila prabhu pad uh, guru maharaj when we talk about these pious activities and uh, uh, these spiritual activities uh, in terms of chanting and other things which mentioned here i have one little doubt uh, <coughs> and this is like uh, when we talk about these activities like religious vows or uh, religious activities but if these religious activities are done as part of nine devotional service to please lord as a like deity service or arch, uh, path save nam and others is that not spiritual activity then um well if it's done to please the lord but it should be done under the direction of the spiritual master not arbitrarily because the spiritual master will not ask you to do these things as as service to the lord but if there is some uh indication that by doing these pious activities that will help them move closer to the mode of goodness then that's done that may the spiritual master may authorize that but that's an individual thing you can that can't be adopted by everyone and considered to be bhakti because it's uh bhakti is to follow the instructions of krishna who come coming through the spiritual master and then act in that way and not simply adopt a particular activity and call it devotional service it's it's still in the realm of karma so um of course in a general sense we have the understanding that if anything is done for the pleasure of the lord it's devotional service but that has to be clarified with uh, proper direction because if you start to do things you like and you want to offer it to the lord in devotion um that has still has the element of karma so it's more like karma yoga and it's not so much bhakti bhakti means to do to follow the instructions of the spiritual master and engage in the service of the lord and so if the spiritual master says you can do these things then they can become bhakti but generally he won't say that unless there is some benefit by performing that activity which will elevate one to a higher plate position where then then they can uh engage in devotional service but that's not generally the case so like giving in charity it's mentioned here I'll give you an example so I'll, i'll give you an example when prabhupada opened the uh, krishna balaram temple um he knew that this Krishna Balaram temple in Vrindavan he knew if he didn't perform these elaborate sacrifices our movement in in Vrindavan would not be accepted by the local mahants sadhus and uh, you know leaders of the the different mosques and temples in Vrindavan he writes about this it's in the bhagavata and he said i i would have simply just had cured time and that would have been enough to install the deities but if i would have did that our movement would not have been accepted and so i went through this these these different yogis so that's an example of how prabhupad you know explained what he did he did it not as a service to the lord but he did it because It was there just like we perform yagyas but if there's there if there's chanting of the holy name of the lord that is it says that is the only sacrifice in this age so if you accompany all activities with the chanting of the holy names of the lord that is good as performing the different yagyas mm-hmm. but that's better than performing the different yagyas mm-hmm. yagnai sankirtanai prayaya janti hi sumedha sadam 
So we have the, when we do initiation ceremonies, we could just do kirtan. But we do the yagya, the fire yagya, because it's done accordingly in the, in the Vedas that way. We follow that, pr that process. But there are many times that people get initiated without the yogis. Does that, that mean that the initiation is less or not bona fide? No. As long as they're chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. But this, for the sake of following the Vedic uh, scheme, we use the yogis in order to introduce various types of uh, uh, results, such as we have vivaha, yagya, marriage, ceremonies. Uh, another, I'll give you another example. Prabhupada was in Nellore in South India. Uh, one lady, she was quite respectable, quite uh, prestigious uh, Hindu family. And uh, she was very much attracted to our movement. So she wanted to uh, perform a, a big yagya. So she invited Prabhupada and all his disciples. And uh, the yagya was to install deities. Mm -hmm. So uh, she had made this elaborate arrangement for this yagya. And she asked Prabhupada to officiate. But Prabhupada could see she was more or less interested in the, in the ostentatious display of this yagya and getting some prestige for, for all of the opulence that she uh, employed in this yagya. But Prabhupada wasn't interested in patronizing her, her desire to be recognized for this. So what he did, he said, give me a conch shell with some milk in it. And then he took the, the conch shell with milk. He poured it over the, the deity, chanted Govindam Adi Purusham Tamaham Bajami. And he said, deity is installed. Another example how these yagyas are subordinate to the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but they have a place, you know. They are part of the Vedas, therefore we follow them in certain cases. But in other cases, we can dispense with them and simply have kirtan, that's all. Sorry, thank you, Guru Maharaj. I think I was on mute. Thank Jimmy, you, Guru Maharaj. It definitely helps. Thank you very did much. Hare Krishna. Did you hear what, did, were you able to hear what I, I Yes, yes, Guru Maharaj. Sorry, it was just only my microphone which was on mute. So, okay. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yeah, you can look it up. It's in the sixth canto, third chapter. I think it's verse number uh, 22, no, 23 or 24 in the purple. Prabhupada talks about the installation of the Krishna of Balaram deities in Vrindavan. Guru Maharaj, this is 621. Six, Canto, third chapter, verses 23 or 24, I'm sure. In the sure. purport. In the purport. Sure. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Thank you, Nath Prabhu. Uh, Devananda Prabhu, uh, you have a question? Yes, I do. Uh, Hare Krishna. Uh, thank you very much, Guru Maharaj. Uh, all glory to you, glory to Srila Prabhupada. Uh, the question is, um, we call ourselves uh, devotees. Uh, um, in Russian, uh, devotee, to devote and to surrender are synonymous. What, for, what in uh, are we, do, do we surrender? You uh, said about such aspect of holy name, of the holy name as mercy. Uh, it seems, to my, my opinion, uh, we um, surrender to mercy, and uh, that's why we are um, devotees, and that's that's why we are theists, uh, who people who have uh, faith in in Lord, in in supreme personality of Godhead. Uh, 
uh, can we say that uh, the one who has not faith in mercy he is atheist he is not theist thank you yeah that's true faith is the foundation by which all activities are performed so without faith there will be no activity and uh, if mercy comes it's not it's not the mercy that elevates one it's the mercy that purifies one or, or punishes one for their wrong activities or for their atheistic and or even their uh, agnostic mentalities yeah faith has to be there faith is the the element by which it can which all activities are performed by which one uh, is motivated to, uh, yeah, to perform the activities. It's based on faith. Yeah, faith has to be there. If faith in the wrong thing is, uh, takes one away from devotional service. I meant, uh, sorry, I meant uh, faith in mercy. Is the, is the key well what, what what does that actually mean faith and mercy mercy is available but mercy comes in different forms god is merciful even to the non-devotees but what kind of mercy are they getting they're getting they're getting the reactions of their activities so mercy is not always something that is uh, of one nature. Uh, if a person performs a wrong activity and are corrected by, by, uh, by, the, by the Lord through some, through some uh, re reaction, that is also mercy. Thank you. That's also mercy. So mercy is not one way. Mercy is something that is beneficial. For a child to get punished for the wrong things they do is good because it helps them to correct. That is also mercy. So punishment also is another form of mercy. Yes, it's clear, but um, I meant that uh, the faith in mercy is um, the... Um, Okay, why we can uh, name ourselves as devotees and as states. And the one who has not faith in mercy, he is a atheist. Well, that's just some interpretation. What it actually means is that if you're a devotee, obviously you have faith. And what do you have faith in? Well, your faith is that if I serve the Lord, he will give me his mercy. Yes, yes. Mercy. Not karma, mercy. Right. Mercy is something that comes by way of the grace of God. Grace. Yeah, if you serve the Lord and you and you have faith in in the Lord, you will receive His mercy. What is that mercy? It comes in different forms, though. It can come with mercy. Can come with realization of an activity in devotional service. It can come with an experience of happiness. It can come in the form of receiving transcendental knowledge. It can come in the form of getting detached from something material. Mercy comes in different ways. So yeah, if you're a devotee, automatically you have faith in the Lord's mercy. If you're not a devotee, then uh, even if they receive the mercy of the Lord, they can't understand it.
Okay, so we move on to the ninth offense. Uh, Guru Maharaj, there is one more uh, question, hands raised by Namrata, if you want to take that question. Of course. Yes, Namrata Mataji, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Hare Krishna, Guru Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, my question was uh, about uh, the katha which we do in uh, in Vaishnava house. Uh, in every Vaishnava house, there, there is a katha called Satyanara and katha. Right. which is performed. Mm. So, uh, is it uh, recommended to perform that kind of katha and uh, should we take uh, uh, Harinam in that katha or it is not advised? Not necessary. Prabhupada never gave us that, that, that process of Satya Narayan katha. He said Krishna katha. <laughs> It's it's coming from the uh, tradition of it's also a part of the devotional tradition, the Satya Narayan. But at the same time, it's not given in our particular uh, particular uh, sampradaya. Srila Prabhupada never did it, and nor recommended we do it. His spiritual masters didn't do it. I've seen devotees do it in order to please the Hindu population, in order to get them more involved with Krishna consciousness. But that was done as a tactic, not simply as a as a means for uh, you know practicing spiritual life. Yes, uh, Guru Maharaj, the uh, Katha itself uh, has uh, materialistic benefits in that. Maybe yeah. that's why. But it's attached yeah. to, it's related to uh, Lord Vishnu. So that's yeah. why I was so confused. And Yeah, that's for those who um, are conditioned to worship the Lord for material benefits. And Maharaj, it is not advisable to take Harinam in this kind of uh, no. activity. Okay. Yeah. No, not at all. We do it according to the tradition given to us by Srila Prabhupada. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. I think that was what the clarification I, I was... Thinking of. When we're doing Harinam, we're thinking of Krishna. <laughs> we're yes. chanting Krishna's name, we're glorifying Krishna. Both the activity and the consciousness directed towards Krishna complete the activity. If we're doing Harinam and we're directing it towards the Satya Narayan Katha, then it's, uh, it's mixing two aspects that uh, that are not meant to be mixed, you know. If you're going to do Satya Narayan Kata, then you do that. But if you're going to do Harinam, then you do that. You don't mix them. Mm -hmm. okay, but as you, say, yeah, yeah, as you say, the Satya Narayan Kata has materialistic benefits. Where Harinam, is, there's nothing material about it. It simply elevates one. onto the spiritual platform. Okay. Okay, Nine thank you, Maharaj. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, very much. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Okay, the ninth offense. Vijay approaches his Raghunath Das Babaji, explain the ninth offense and quench our thirst for knowledge. So he, when he asks his question about the ninth offense, he always glorifies the benefit of hearing the explanation. We will get knowledge. Of all the instructions given in the entire Vedic scripture, the direction to chant Harinam is the foremost. Only those persons who have cultivated firm strata faith and Sudha Bhakta are eligible candidates for hearing the unlimited glories of Harinam. So 
Only those persons who have cultivated firm faith in pure devotional service are eligible candidates for hearing the unlimited glories of Harinam. Faithless persons are generally averse to spiritual activities and to, and to hearing the glories of Harinam. Therefore, to instruct such irreligious faithless people about the esoteric details of Harinam is offense. Certainly, it is necessary, necessary to explain to the general population that chanting Harinam is the most beneficial spiritual practice and that those who practice will achieve complete benediction. Yet the confidential knowledge of Harinam and the esoteric science of chanting should be disclosed only to the worthy and faithful. Is that clear? And that's the essence right there. He kind of culminates that. The confidential knowledge of Harinam and the esoteric science of chanting should be disclosed only to the worthy and faithful. That means the benefits of pure devotional service. When one becomes a realized Uttama Adhikari Bhakti, Bhakta, one will acquire the Shakti to empower others to take up devotional service. An Uttama Adhikari can instill faith in Harinam in the conditioned jivas and then instruct them in the chanting of the Hari, uh, of Harinam by bestowing his Bhakti Shakti. However, as long as one remains a Madhyamam Adhikari Bhakti, one must carefully avoid companionship with the faithless, the gross materialist, disinterested, and the atheist. And then there's a question. So here it says that the Uttama Harikari, when he's He's, he's, he can instill faith in Harinam to those who are to the conditioned jivas. But one on the lower platform, Madhya, must be careful to avoid such activities with faithless, gross materialists, those who are disinterested in the atheists. So here we see an element of purity that is superior and therefore can empower or awaken um, Krishna consciousness in the conditioned cell of souls, where those on the lower platform cannot and should avoid it. Vijay, Gurudev, there are many persons who initiate unfit, unfit persons into Harinam for material gain and personal fame. How should we see them? They are Nama Parad, offenders against the holy name. Okay, anything, questions about this ninth offense now? Yes, Shidevi Mataji, go ahead. Thank you, Shidevi Sir, dear Guru Maharaj, I would like a little clarification on this particular part where it says that to the general population, one must encourage them to chant saying that this is the most beneficial spiritual practice. So that means in classes or in general, if we are doing Harinam, we can just uh, tell people about the holy name. But anything further, like telling anything more about Radha and Krishna or the pastimes, anything, is to be done only on the more um, like uh, advanced stages of bhakti, not to the general population. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you'll see, Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Prabhupada makes this statement that he didn't speak about Radha Krishna Leelas in public. So we just encourage people to understand the benefits by saying this is the highest in this age of Kali. Chanting is the highest and the most uh, important spiritual practice. 
No, and, no, you don't want to say that. You say if you chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, you will experience happiness. You'll be free from material suffering. Just keep it basic. The, the, this chanting is an age-old chant that has been done by great personalities that have lived thousands of years ago. Um, this will connect you with the, uh, well, not even that, you just basic, will relieve stress, will elevate your consciousness to a state of happiness, will free you from suffering. That's good enough. Yes, Guru Maharaj. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. The more we get into these more lengthy explanations, the more we're likely to fall into something that is unrecognizable by these other persons and therefore sometimes criticizable by them also. That you want to avoid. You want to avoid them becoming critical of what you're saying. Okay, any other questions? Ninth offense. There is no questions, Guru Maharaj, looks like. Vijay, there is the tenth Naparad. Kindly explain it to us more fully. Hmm. Bhaganath Das Babaji, certain types of men are greatly inebriated by their false ego. Imagining themselves to be the monarchs of everything they survey, and thus they treat their imagined subordinates as their serfs with the gross mentality of me and mine. On rare creations, they are gripped with the desire for renunciation and a curiosity for the spiritually, spiritual unknown. They approach the learned Sutta Bhaktis and hear about the glories of Harinam, but they do not receive this knowledge with proper faith and devotion and eventually turn back to their material attachments. They are Namaparadis. The second verse from the Shik Shastika recommends Nam Nam Akari Bahudani Jisarva Shaktish Tatar Pitan Niamitas Marane Nukalaha Eta Dusrita Bakripa Bhagavan Mama Pi Dor Daiva Midri Samahajani Nanuragaha. My Lord. O oh, Supreme Personality of Godhead, in your transcendental names, there is all good fortune for the living entity. And therefore, you have many such names as Krishna and Govinda, by which you expand yourself. You invested all of your energies in these names, and there are no hard and fast rules for chanting these names. My dear Lord, although you bestow such mercy upon the fallen souls by liberally distributing your transcendental names, I am so unfortunate that I commit offenses while chanting your name, and therefore I cannot develop attachment from chanting. So my son, these are the 10 apparats. Avoid committing them, and very soon Sri Krishna Nam will shower upon you blessings and will elevate you to the platform of Sudha Bhakti and that of being an Uttama Adhikari. So in that closing statement, we can see how essential and important it is to avoid these 10 offenses. Okay, any questions about the last one? The last one is called me and mine. The me and mine offense, as it's mentioned here. Sometimes we say that after hearing so many instructions on the holy name, we still remain attached to, the to performing activities for material benefit. That is another way to interpret this offense. 
after hearing sufficiently all of the lectures, after engaging in devotional service, after performing the chanting, one still thinks that I can find happiness on the material platform. And one performs these activities in order to achieve this imagined happiness. Okay. Any further questions? <laughs> Hare Krishna Guru Maharaj. Uh, so uh, I just have a little question on the first line. Oh, okay. Um, uh, when it says, um, uh, when Raghunath Das Babaji is saying that some people are, you know, are suffering from um, a false ego and uh, other uh, anarthas and uh, they cannot benefit. So in some way or other, like we are not completely, you know, uh, purified in, uh, uh, in all of our anarthas. Uh, so do we still call, like, uh, uh, there are many cases, like, you know, if um, one of the other things comes up as anartha and uh, chanting is uh, inattentive, is not, you know, uh, focused properly. So would that be also Nama Pradis? Uh, um, like, would we still call ourselves, like, uh, would we, uh, we still be Nama Pradis when, when try, we do this? Try, try, to, try to understand. There's no, there's no disqualification for chanting the holy names and engaging in devotional service. Even if you're honeycombed with material desires, you can still perform the, the holy, you can still chant the holy name and you can still engage in devotional service. The activity of devotional service is given in the form of knowledge. That knowledge helps you to understand what your activities in devotional service are and what your activities in devotional service should not be. So although you you still have material desires, it's not a disqualification for performing devotional service. The disqualification comes when we still try to act on these material desires to find happiness and try to fulfill them. There's where we become disqualified. Not because we have them, but because we act on them. Understand, yeah. Just don't act on it. That's all. Act in Krishna consciousness. Thank you. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. And I have one more question about um, um, uh, when you said it's about me and mine. And uh, what I know that, uh, you know, 10th offense is more of, you know, inattentive chanting uh, when you, you're not focused. So, how does two things uh, relate? Uh, well, you, you have to overcome inattentive chanting by attentive chanting. You have to be wary that your attention, your attention is not fixed and you have to practice chanting attentively. That's all. And when Rasi says uh, me and mine, does it mean that we have to come out of a false ego and uh, uh, be humble? What does Krishna say in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita? What is the, first, the, the second chapter all about? At least the beginning of the second chapter. We are not this body. How, this. Much, how, many, how many verses does he devote attention to that subject? I don't know. Maybe there's quite a lot of 70, 72 something verses are there. But, yeah, how uh, many? How many verses does he, he, he discuss the difference between the body and the soul? Kind of most of it, but I don't remember exact number. Uh, also, Pramataji is saying 2.11 to 2.30. Premakishori that's, Mataji. Yeah, that's correct. Um, he's just on that one point. Krishna is explaining that same principle from different angles of vision using different examples. Why? Because unless we understand that, there's no progress in devotional service. <laughs> if you still think you're this body, then, then, uh, 
then uh, how will you understand the activities of devotional service as being transcendental? We should at least theoretically know we're not this body and we should act on the spiritual platform. Acting on the spiritual platform is indicative of the knowledge that we are not this body. This is what I always feel like uh, I, every time I think of Bhagavad Gita when Krishna says that we are not, you know, Krishna is describing the soul. And uh, when it's we talk about the gross and subtle body and thinking about that false ego is part of that, you know, part of us. So how can we always like I feel that for false ego is always there part of us like it can never be removed from us. Like, how can we come to the platform of thinking that we are not this body? And it's just, it's really, you know, a very uh, silly question. Uh, I, just say, I, just, I just answered it. When you act on the spiritual platform, that's all, instead of acting on the material platform. When you're acting on the material platform, you're reinforcing the idea you are this body. When you're acting on the spiritual platform, you're reinforcing the idea that I am the spirit soul. And that means carefully follow the instructions of the spiritual master, which are meant to get you off the material platform. <coughs> That's all. Don't try to complicate it. <laughs> it's very simple. You may not fully realize you're not this body, but you should understand that there are activities and there are material activities and spiritual activities. You should perform spiritual activities and not material activities. And if there's some need to perform material activities in order to support one's life in the material world, that is, that is that's, not, that's not fully material. It's just called Gona Bhakti. It's activities in, in the parallel to devotional service that are required, such as, you know, you have to keep the body clean, you have to eat, you have to sleep, well, these things need to be done. Makes sense. Why? Because the body is useful for devotional service. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it much clarifies now. Thank you. It's common sense. It's common sense. <laughs> yeah, I just, uh, I mean, I'm asking this because I don't know how to answer this person. That's why I'm asking. Uh, the comment came that uh, we should have some enjoyment also, no Mataji? Once in a while, he should allow me to go shopping. I like to watch movies also. All this is denied to me now. I, 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 I'm not allowed to enjoy. I want my daughter to learn bowling. She should have some exposure to bowling alleys and learn. Well, how to be if, you, if you call those activities enjoying, that means you're an illusion. <laughs> Yeah, you. If you want to do them, that's one thing, but don't call them enjoying. Real enjoyment is uh, is your connection on the spiritual platform. That's what enjoyment. There is no there's no enjoyment on the material platform. But it's I feel different. very happy when I go shopping. It relieves all my stress, and I yeah. feel so. Yeah, so yeah. Enemies. A person who is intoxicated with some kind of liquor, he also feels happy. <laughs> Okay. It's a, form, it's a form of intoxication, that's all. <laughs> mm. okay. Thank you, Maharaj. You see it? You clear? Understand? Yes. Yes. I'm very clear that I don't want to call this, but I have a counselee who is uh, claiming that this is the way she relieves her stress and wants enjoyment and things like that. And I don't know what to tell her. But now I can tell her this is just addiction to another form of material trying to look for, manipulate the material energy for some enjoyment. And again, that will fall. And then you'll have to find something else. And it'll go on like that. So that's not the answer. That's not where we can get real enjoyment. Real enjoyment is in our relationship with Krishna and the activities of Krishna consciousness. Yeah, a, a pig is eating stool. And if you give him halava, He'll reject the halibut and eat stool. 
So for a pig, eating stool is enjoyment. For a person in illusion in the material world, then material activities are forms of enjoyment. But if you want to you want to clarify that in terms of what is real enjoyment, you have to understand that real enjoyment is based on something that is part of your nature and not something ephemeral or something that is presupposed by my idea. Yeah, all the material enjoyments are not enjoyments. They're just temporary uh, activities that are trying to relieve one form of suffering. That's all. You're hungry, that's suffering. You eat, that's fulfilling that desire, that, that stops the suffering. You call that enjoyment? It's the counteracting the suffering. That's all it is. You're sick, you go to the doctor, you get some medicine, you get cured, and you think, well, I'm happy now. Well, you, it's now, all you did was counteract the suffering. Counteracting suffering is not happiness. <laughs> it's just a relief from the suffering. And from the material point of view or the material definition, it, it goes on as happiness. It's not real happiness. That's why Krishna says, Yehi sparsas to God, Boga, Dukha, Yona, Yevate, Avanta, Vanta, Kunta, Yanateshu, Ramate, Guha. Look up that verse in the uh, fifth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. Uh, what is that? Fifth chapter, is that? What, what's the first word I said? I forgot the first word. Uh, I shared my screen manage. I think it's around 520 something. Yeah, 522. Yes, yeah, what I thought. Thank you. And you know, an intelligent person does not take part in the sources of misery. Yeah, he's some sparse job over. What you do to contact with material senses. O oh, son of Kanti, such pleasures, such pleasures have a beginning and an end, and a wise man does not delight them. Intelligence does not take part in the sources of misery. So these pleasures are sources of misery. And what, how do they come? With the senses and the sense objects. One who is wise sees what they are. They are just sources of misery. The one who is not, one who is under the influence of the material energy, thinks that these are four forms of pleasure. That's all. And when they, don't, when they get some misery, they don't see that the, the connection to the misery they're suffering is due to the attempt to enjoy the senses. That's all. They can't see the connection between the two. Yeah, he's, yeah, so, okay. Yes, Mara, thank you very much for all those references. They are going to come in handy. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I have to run because there's a few things that are coming up right now, but we'll see you all again tomorrow. And we'll again, uh, we'll broach a new subject and I'll let you know when the time comes. Thank, Thank you. you very much for obeisances to all the devotees of the Lord. Bancha Kalpa, Tarivascha, Kripa Sindhu, Devacha, Pitanam, Pavanibyo, Vaishnavibyo, Namahonamaha, Gaur Bhaktavindaki Jai. Jai. All right.